Okay, thank you so much. Uh, really good to be with you. Uh, Shelly and I uh, are together and we're um, here in town. Um, we were a part of a conference last week, uh, Heather Lynn and Jason, uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that. We're traveling around the country together. Um, and we're part of a church in Minneapolis uh, called Solomon's Porch. And uh, we really feel like we're part of the same big family with all of you. Part of the reason we were together uh, last week down in Marco was that I was hoping to run a conference uh, under the banner of this thing we call Convergence, sort of a coming together of people who are doing some interesting things around the United States and around the world and expressing some new and fresh ways of uh, spirituality in North America and Christianity. It's super fun. It was a great time to play at. And um, so you might not know that you have sort of uh, distant family cousins up on the uh, northern parts of the states. Uh, but up in Minneapolis where we are, um, you might not know that there's a little tribe up there uh, called Solomon's Porch that um, would feel like we're connected to you. And you haven't met them yet. Sort of like when you show up at one of those old family reunions and you're meeting those distant cousins and you didn't know that there were so many of you, uh, we really feel like we're part of the same effort with you. So if you ever make your way up north, I don't know why that would happen, but if it were to happen, Know that you have somewhere to stay, and you have some friends up there, and uh, we'd love to uh, we'd love to have you be part of it, uh, of what's going on with you up there. Um, so we're in town, and then we're going to drive back to Minneapolis. Actually, uh, Shelley's going to fly tomorrow, but then Heather Lynn and Jason and I are going to be in a car, in a big van, uh, and we're going to be driving north, and we'll stop in Atlanta on Tuesday, and we'll stop in Franklin, Tennessee on Wednesday, and Nashville on on uh, Thursday, and Chicago on Friday. You know, because we're traveling around as sort of uh, like a traveling band and a traveling evangelist or something. We're um, t talking about this book that I wrote and music that Heather Lynn has put together. So if you join us tonight over Zookies, Zookies or Zookies? Zookies. Uh, you'll get a little taste of that. There's probably some wings. There'll be some basketball on, but they'll also have a little hour and 15 minute long show. It's really super fun. The book is called Flipped. And it's called Flipped, uh, playing off of the phrase of Jesus, you have heard it said, but I say to you. I like to call that the flip. We all have a story in our head. We all have something that frames our lives. We have lots of things that go around in our thinking and the way that we've understood ourselves in the world. And very often, our lives are opened up and made better when those things are flipped. <coughs> Jesus is famous for saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you. That's super refreshing stuff. It doesn't always come easily to someone. It certainly didn't in Jesus' day. It doesn't in our day. When people have a way that they've understood the world, when they've understood themselves or God or other people or what we're all doing here or how we're supposed to do it here, that sometimes we're called to change that. Jesus used a much more, you know, we would sort of have quote him using a much more religious term. I call it a flip. He calls it repentance. <laughs> Sometimes we see those old preachers standing out on the street corners doing the best they've got, you know, yelling at people and pounding on them that they have to repent or something's going to happen. Jesus' invitation is much more whimsical than that. It's much more important than that. It's much more meaningful than that. It's this call to say, you've heard the world is this way, but I say, think again. Understand it in a new way. Repent. Live into the good news. You've heard that the kingdom of God is somewhere else, some other time, some other place. But I say to you, repent and believe the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. This kind of thing, right? It's really famous in Jesus' way of moving about the world to say to people, yes, you've got it like this, but think on it like this. In fact, maybe some of those famous phrases of Jesus already come to mind when you just hear me say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Does anybody have any of those in their, in their mind already? Some... Memory of Jesus saying, you've heard it said, what, and I say to you, what? Anybody have any of those? Yeah. You've heard it said, uh, uh, an eye for an eye, but a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Don't take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's going to get us nowhere. This is the thing about a flip, right? Is that you've tried that path. You've been there. We so often get stuck in ways that don't make our lives what we want them to mean. So Jesus says, let's... Form, let's shape, let's live into a new kind of humanity and stop this eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth for some. Now, the thing is, some of you have read your Old Testament. It says, take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and no more. It was meant to be a limiting factor. Like if someone takes your eye, don't take their head. Just take your eye, right? And Jesus says, well, let's take that even better. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Let's do away with all of it. That caused him a whole lot of trouble because there was an awful lot structured around these old stories. Right. Anybody else? And I, uh, uh, you've heard it said, but I say to you, this going on in your mind? Yes. Uh, yes, love your neighbors and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. Pray for them. 
Don't act like you don't have enemies. You might have people that are your enemies. What are you supposed to do with them? Love them like you would a friend. Others, you've heard it said, but I say to you, I mean, those are a couple of the real famous ones. There's a few more. And anybody else with one in there? Do not commit adultery. That one comes up all the time. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, don't even objectify another person and turn him into your object. See him as a whole person. Jesus would have said it a little differently. Don't burn with lust in your heart for someone. Don't treat them like that. Like there's some sort of object that you got. So anyway, this idea is so rich and it moves in so many ways. In fact, I think one way to look at all the Gospels is that Jesus is constantly going around saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. It comes from the, hey, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's stop acting as if they're two different things. It might be Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. It's all the time. It's not just one little phrase. It seems as if Jesus is calling for this whole restructuring. So one of the reasons we're traveling around saying to people in bars and cafes and other places that there's a flip available is because most of us would love to be free of the stories that we have trapped in our own heads. That's not a bad idea. So if you have friends that may not like to, you know, they're not necessarily getting up at, uh, you know, uh, 10 in the morning to show up at, uh, at a church meeting. Uh, our church meets at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the afternoon, so I understand this kind of thing. Um, maybe you have some people that would show up at 7.30 over at Zookies, though, and want to talk about some of this stuff. So grab some of those people and bring them along. And the reason we think it's worth this conversation, for me, uh, the reason I think so, is that there's a bunch of flips. I didn't grow up religiously. I didn't grow up in a family that went to church. We didn't do church things. I don't know those, all those songs. Um, and, uh, but there was this story that grabbed my life. The story of Jesus sort of captivated. It wasn't a story of a particular. It's as if the story of Jesus became the story of every one of us. And I, I really attached into that. And then there was another flip that happened to me. And actually, we read it in the readings today. It was the one that Roy did. But it's also the one that Sharon did. And it's also the reading that Wes did this morning. All of those readings sort of loop together. The big one that hit me, and I write about it in the book, is this one I'd like to chat with you about a little bit today. It's this idea that the Apostle Paul comes with. He, in the, 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 the scripture where you were all standing up during that one, it was telling the story that Paul's in this place in Athens, Greece, right? It's a place that's often called Mars Hill, if you've heard that name in the Bible. So he's in this place, and it's kind of a marketplace, and people around, and he's telling people stories. He's talking to philosophers, and he's talking to people in religious settings. Then he's out in the marketplace. So we're kind of trying to do the same thing, right? Like we're kind of going into religious places, and then we're going to go into little marketplaces. And he's telling this story. And the people respond, if you remember the reading. The people respond like, what's he talking about? It seems as if he's talking about something totally different than what we've heard. Right? You can almost hear the refrains of Jesus saying, you've heard it said, but I say to you. In fact, the book of Acts one way to see it is as if it's all the things that the followers of Jesus went off and did that look an awful lot like the things that Jesus did. So they just keep doing it in a non-identical way. I like to think of it as non-identical repetition. Doing the same thing in a totally different way. But Paul is there and people are saying, we don't understand what you're getting at. So in that stage, in that place, there were lots of idols. There were lots of temples. Religion was a big deal. Religion's a big deal in a lot of places in the world. It's a big deal in our world. And there they had lots of temples that would be set around with lots of idols or ways that you would access God. In Jesus' period, years earlier, and over in Jerusalem, rather than in Athens, Greece, but over in Jerusalem, there was one primary temple called Solomon's Temple. In fact, there was a public meeting area outside the temple, Solomon's Temple, called the Portico, Colonnade, or Porch area. That's where we pick up our church name, Solomon's Porch. But there, there was one temple everyone needed. But where Paul is, there's a whole bunch of them. And he's doing the same thing Jesus was doing. Jesus was saying years earlier in the big temple, tear this whole temple down if you need to. It's all going to come crashing down. This religious system that seems to hold God, where people think God is in there, that God is somehow accessed by going into the temple or through some sort of an idol or through some sort of a sacrifice, that that's how you get to God, that whole thing is coming crashing down, Jesus says. Paul says that later in a little different way to these people in Greece. And the reading that we have, can you pull up like verse 23, I think is where it is? Can you jump ahead uh, from 23? So Paul says it like this. I walked around your city and I looked around carefully at your objects of worship. I found among them an altar with an inscription to an unknown God even. Right? Like, they have 
the sun god and the moon god and the harvest god and the sex god and the food god and the blessing god, all these different gods, they all have a story in their head that you access God through those ways. A bunch of us still have stories in our heads. And when you really start listening, it's like, boy, it's almost as if we could create these little temples or these little processes, these little special ways that you get to God. So Paul says, I, I want to tell you about this unknown God. I mean, they were sort of like, get the all of the above plus one, right? Like, we'll just throw one out to everybody. So I want to tell you about this unknown God, and if you would. The God who made everything in the world and everything of all everything, the one who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines created by human hands. Not the temple in Jerusalem, not the temple over there, not the temple of the bread, not the temple of this church, not the temple of the yoga class. There's no temples that hold God. That's not the story. God doesn't live in those places. Then he goes on. Nor is he served by human hands. This gets really pushy. Jesus said the same kind of stuff. Don't live with God as if somehow you're some slave that's serving the master. Instead, I call you friends. God doesn't want to be served by human hands as though God needs something. God's not in some transaction with you where God has a need and you have the thing and you got to do the deal so that you can be in the thing with God. All that transaction business, all that punch in the right code, all that punch in the right ideas, all that punch the code of any kind to make it work, that's not what this is about. Since God himself gives to all mortals life and breath of all things. And it goes on. From one ancestor, God made all the inhabitants of all the earth. Why are we all divided in these little bitty bulks, these little bitty pieces, this little my group and your group and your group and us over there and you over there? And he creates all the places and all that they're going to live. And it goes on and says, so that the world could reach out for God and even find God. God is findable. God's not hidden in some temple. God's not far from all of us. And here comes the big flip. For... God doesn't live in those places. Rather, in God, we live and move and have our life. <clears throat> the big flip is not that God lives in us. It's that we live in God. As even some of your own poets said, for we too are his offspring. So the whole community of the humanity and the planet and all lives in God as one big family. This was radical 2,000 years ago. It's radical today. It's crazy how long it's taken for us to even listen to Jesus who would say, in you, you live in me as I live in you and I live in the Father and we are one. Or the, 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 the piece that was read by Wes. In him were all things created and hold together. The beauty of this story is not that God is in some places and not other places, that God is in you but not in me. It's not that somehow we're going to do something to serve or to get to God. That's been trying to be eliminated from the Christian story from the very start. It's been a better story all along of in God we live and move and have our being. So our big call, it seems to me, in our lives is that how do we live in God, where there's no boundaries and there's no ins and outs, but all live and move and have their being in God, where everything counts as being in God. There's not a religious thing and a non-religious thing. We're all in this. We're all swimming in this thing together. We find ourselves in God. So the question for a lot of us is, how then does one live integrated with yourself and God and others in God. We know what it's like to be in something but not live integrated with it. Like our own bodies. We're like our lives, we're in our bodies, like there's nothing else, like we're, it's all us, right? This is all you. But we still talk about our bodies sometimes as if there's some other thing. My hand hurts. As if we own our hand as some separate thing. You know, like, my phone battery is dead, and my hand hurts. <laughs> right? It's a weird way to think about it. So we want to find ways to live integrated in our own bodies. And many of us find it very difficult to even live integrated with our own selves, with our own emotions. There's a lot of work we have to do in our lives to just come to grips with ourselves, to live integrated with ourselves. Some of us don't even want to know the truth about ourselves. I'm not going to go talk to a 
therapist. You're not going to go say something during confession out loud in front of people. You're not going to run the story that way. You find it much easier to want to hide away a little piece of your life. That psalm that Sharon read, is Sharon, is that right? Sharon. The psalm that Sharon read, Psalm 139, uh, uh, Danny read it in the, first, in the first service, and I said to him, that was the best reading of Psalm 139 I had ever heard. And it was right up until I heard yours. <laughs> That's the best reading of that song I've ever heard. We do soapbox sermons at Solomon's Porch in the summers where people can sign up uh, to do a 10-minute soapbox sermon on anything they want. They don't have to check it with anyone. They just get 10 minutes. And they get it all started prepared. We'll do two or three of them a night. It's a great release valve. It's fantastic. Everybody's got a 10-minute sermon in you. And Liz did one a couple of years. And Liz did one a couple of years ago. And she did it on that Psalm 139. God, where can I go and be out of your presence? If I go to the heights, you're there. If I go to the depths, you're there. If I go over there, you're over there. If I go underneath the ground, you're there. There's nowhere I can go. You see me totally and completely. And Liz said, she's a psychotherapist, and she said, I don't think this is just a psalm of praise. I think it's a dirge. I think it's someone saying, I want to hide. The human capacity to want to hide is so strong and even though the prophets and our Lord tells us that we live in God, we want to say, no, 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 God lives in the temple. I don't want to be so totally known. So we hide. That's what the psalmist is going through. That little line, the way Sharon read, it's too much. Think of it like someone just curling in the corner. Don't see me naked. Don't see me totally as I am. So we just keep creating this non-identical repetition. We're in God and then we hide. Our narratives even start like that, right? Like the Genesis narratives, the creation narratives, creating all of humanity, God living perfectly with humanity, and then they taste of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, and then what do Adam and Eve do in that story? They start hiding. So it becomes this whole story of hiding, and as my friend Stan said this week, estrangement. They're not separated from God, they're estranged from God. <coughs> Some of us have lived in really hard relationships. We know what that's like. Some of us can feel estranged from ourselves. So it's almost as if there's this tendency to create this system, this transaction, these idols, this service by which we can just sneak away and not be fully known. I know you've heard it said. Or run your own script about whatever it means for you to hide from God and from yourself and from anyone else. Jesus says, but I say to you, stop with these separations. Stop with separating yourself. Stop with separating God from humanity. I mean, we can put it together in Jesus so well, right? And then when it comes to us, it can become so easy to just hide away. So you see this narrative over and over. Don't create these systems and structures that keep people. But live in God. For in God we live and we move, and we have our being. It restructures all of life. No ins and outs, no ups and downs. Everything we live and do and breathe is part of our life with God. It's a totally reinvigorating way. I think this is what Jesus was getting at when he talked about the kingdom of God. In his day, you had the kingdom of Caesar in Caesarea. Caesar was the king. You had the kingdom of David in the temple, and they were at war with each other. And Jesus says, there's something much better than the kingdom of Caesar and the kingdom of David. It's the kingdom of God, that you can't get out of, it doesn't have any boundaries, and no one rules over anyone else. Amen. It's a really intriguing notion and idea. So in our community, we have a little practice that when someone talks at you for the spirit of that, my friend Tom, who's doing the sermon at, at Solomon's Porch today, has this saying, he says, you know, every time I walk into a religious meeting, I find myself asking three questions. Who are you, to the preacher, when will you be done, <laughs> and why are you yelling at me? <laughs> So we have this little practice where we like to say to people, what are you thinking about all this? What's going on in your mind? And we have a little process, we open it up. So I, I wonder what you're all thinking. How are you thinking about any of these ideas? Uh, what's, what's going on in your head right now? It's, you're welcome to have it be a, you know, think of it more like, uh, you know, Holy Thursday's potluck is going to be, where everyone's going to bring something, and you'll figure out your own plate and put it together. It doesn't have to be a 
finely crafted statement that goes perfectly, like the wine's going to go perfectly with the meat. Well, you're Methodist. You might not know that. Some people drink wine. <laughs> that the soft drink doesn't have to go perfectly with the salad. It can, you can mash this whole thing up any way you like and say whatever you'd like to say. But anybody thinking anything about this that you'd like to say out loud to, to, to one another? Yeah. Uh, what we're thinking of our, our Muslim brothers and what they're thinking of us. I mean, yeah. Boy, we live in this in this us them world, don't we? I mean, boy, you start reading if you're a nerd like me, and you sit around reading the Bible, uh, you know, on afternoons. You, you you read stuff in the Book of Acts about the Jews and the Gentiles, and boy, it starts sounding an awful lot alike, doesn't it? Like the story we have ourselves. And, and the Apostle Paul was really into that kind of metaphor, you know, fixing the Jew and Gentile problem. And I, when I, Roy gave me a tour around the facility here, the whole campus, and pointed out that this had been a seed farm. And I thought that was so interesting, how they would grow. I don't really understand how agriculture like that works, how you can grow one plant, then you can grow another plant, and then if you cut it in a certain way where the life force is coming out of the one, you graft it in. Paul uses this kind of language about uh, the Jews and the Gentiles, how they get grafted in Jesus together so that there's this new variety that grows. That's like the history of this land and some of the history of what this community is doing, how you're grafting something new together. And the beauty is that wasn't something that just had to happen once. That becomes our call in all our places. This gets really interesting for the story of faith. You can almost hear Jesus talking about you know, the kinds of things that made the people in his day get a little leery of him when he said, I have sheep of a pasture that you don't know anything about. Or he's with the woman on the, temple, on the mountain who's hiding from him when she finds out that he's a prophet and says, oh, I'm a Samaritan. Uh, we have a you know, we're of a different ethnic and religious structure than yours. So we don't know the temple. I didn't know you're a prophet. And Jesus says, a time is coming. And it's great. And now is. when We won't worship God on the mountain or in the temple, but we'll worship God in spirit and truth. Oh, boy. I mean, all of a sudden you're like, this isn't just our problem that newly, like we have a lot of new problems on the, in the world today. Like, you know, 2,000 years ago, people worried that the planet would kill them. We are still worried about that. We're also worried that we might kill the planet. So we've got some extra worries on our day. But that one feels like, no, that's our ancient struggle. Like we're in on this one from the beginning. This is Jacob and Esau stuff. Like we've been at this for 5,000 years of recorded human history. Let's learn a few things about this. So anyway, I've got, got a little preaching on that. I won't get preaching on everyone's comments. <laughs> Did you have a comment you still want to say? Well, actually, I was thinking very similar thoughts yeah. because um, uh, Christianity is one thing, but um, Buddha came to the world, a huge part of the world, yeah. the same way. Yeah. I'm quite sure from God to statements, you've heard it said, but I say to you, if we limit that in our imaginations, only that Jesus gets to do that, life sort of slows down a little bit in ways we may not want it to. If we can also offer to others that we could say, oh, I've heard it said this, but you just said that. What's that about? When people make statements, beautiful statements like that, they can be sort of, uh, are you willing to say your name? Daryl. Daryl. Uh, you, you can say like, oh, that's what Daryl thinks? That's good, right? Oh, okay, that's Daryl. The other way to hear that is, I wonder why that's important to Daryl, right? And all of a sudden, that comment becomes an invitation into a conversation together, which is really interesting. Right? What does this mean for us to start to live with all of humanity, as Paul would say, who are all of the same offspring, all part of the same family of God? Oh, man, that is... That, that gets to be the kind of question that's, that feels really Jesus-y in the world. What does that mean? All the little children, right? You start putting the accent on those 
on those phrases. Man, it is uh, this in thing is really a big deal, I think. I think that's probably why Jesus talked about it, Paul talked about it. So I've been rambling on. stop killing in the name of God. Yeah, it'd be good if we'd all stop killing each other, right? <laughs> if you wouldn't kill your brother, you wouldn't kill another. You know, that kind of thing. That's a, I just made that up right now. Right. <laughs> that, 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 I'm sure somebody said that before. I probably heard it somewhere. But that, that's, that's a real thing, right? That's the story of Easter, right? It's our recognition that when we tell the Easter story, we say to ourselves, you know how bad it can get for us when we don't live in God? We will separate out and even take the very one of God and think that that's the one who's the outsider. We'll even, we would, we as a, as, a, as a people would even crucify the Son of God. That's how bad it can get. And if we think we can do that, we really have to get busy on this stuff. That's why Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Let us start over on all this stuff. Don't make this the end of the road. Yes. So life comes, resurrection comes to say, let's start that, let's flip that thing. Resurrection is this great flip. I understand that Reverend Roy does a little cartwheel flip at these <laughs> things. That like that's that picture, right? That that thing, that what gets put in the grave is not us, it's death. It's that notion of separation. This idea that somehow we have to live estranged ourselves, with God, with one another. So no matter where you go, no matter how far you think you have to run, it's really great news that we don't have to run, we don't have to hide, for in God we live and move and have our being. Amen for now? Amen. Amen. Amen.